Hello, I'm Helene Oberman, Managing Director of Interior Design. With the imminent return to work post-pandemic, there are a myriad of questions and concerns that arise, ranging from the overall design of the physical space to the emotional and psychological well-being of its inhabitants, all with the mindset to create a safer, healthier, and more resilient arrival back to the office. Today, I have Joe Connell, Principal of Perkins & Will, and Mindy O'Gara, Director of Product and Learning Experience of Interface, who will discuss the considerations and impact on space and people in the now, the near, and the next. No they will share their insights on how they are developing innovative solutions to the challenges both their clients and their own firms are facing as they prepare the return to work. So welcome and thank you both so much for being here. I know the idea of the, you know, this return to work is at the forefront of everyone's minds right now, but certainly before we come up with a solution, we first, try, we first need to identify the problem, correct? So the issues surrounding um, the return to the workplace may obviously be different from those going back to school, um, which is also a very you know, important environment out there. Um, how are you both going about pinpointing these challenges for you, your firms, and of course for your clients? Joe, Mindy, anyone want to <laughs> jump in? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Of course, we started to see as soon as the pandemic, actually, as soon as the exits from the workplace happened, the call started to happen about what return might look like. Uh, that's because everyone, like all of us, were glued to the TV and to the media trying to find out what's it mean? What do these numbers mean? What is flattening the curve? What does it mean about uh, a recurrence of a pandemic? What, what, does, what does it all mean? And how do how do design professionals and how is the industry starting to tackle in some return? What does that look like? And then frankly, even more immediately was what does the now look like? How do we take care of people that are not in our, in their workplaces, but have to work? So lots of adjusting, of course, and we're still doing that, right? We're not in our workplaces right now. So when we talk about the now, we had to first just make sure like, do people have the tools, technology, the variety, the ergonomics, do they have the tools they need to be somewhat effective in the now. And then immediately, once, once that's taken care of, then what does next look like? And that, as you mentioned, that, Helene, that's, that's different for every state, municipality, and industry. Some people have decided to set up temporary offices, office, offsite locations. Some have, have started to take very conservative approaches. You've, we've all been um, aware of the tech companies that say, you know what, we'll just take the year off from trying to go back to the workplace, take the pressure off, because there's so many variables. Well, a lot of us um, in, in the, on the A&D side are, are, are actually working on trying to look at what the roadmap to return to the workplace looks like. So we've created a pretty robust tool that we update every, every week, but really trying to look at those issues about how we can accommodate the tasks safely, dealing with the, just the, the, the cleaning, the really three variables getting back to the office. One is the issue of the physical adaptations that may need to occur, including distancing, the other is maintenance, and the last is behavior. Behavior is the toughest one, and that's one that we're, we're facing for, differently for each client, but it's one that's certainly on the minds as we are all doing our planning. So I know within the, in, within the design industry as a whole, we've been speaking about sort of the importance of health and wellness. Actually, you know, for, for many years now, it's sort of been at the forefront, but have you found the dialogue has sort of shifted about physical space? Um, in terms of sort of, you know, obviously physical, but mental and emotional security and safety, as opposed to just sort of the health and well-being of someone? Not much so. I mean, very much so. We, if, you know, as, as you say, we, the, the, the well-being and the wellness um, awareness came out of the earlier work in sustainability. And sort of sustainability growing up, um, it be is became wellness, and then that turned into well-being. And well-being, of course, takes into account everything from mental health, physical health, active design, resilience, and, res and, and restoration, both for personal and for organizations and communities. So there's a much more expansive view of what well-being means. Um, and it's taken on an even greater dimension now, and awareness now, which we think is, is only good news. But I, I will say I'm... I'm I'm quite impressed by the design industry in general. I, I often am, and, and, but in this case, they really do rise up because even, even though many of you are right, this is like lightning bolt kind of change that comes really out of nowhere. No one, this was on no one's uh, to-do list for 2020. The basic premise of design has not changed, which is we are 
we are problem seekers, yeah. we're, we're problem understanders, and then we're problem solvers. And it's just, it's a different problem. So there's new, new constraints, there's new problems, we deal with those, and we try to creatively solve these in, in human and humanistic ways, and then we move on. And, um, and then there's another problem that has to be addressed. So in this way, our industry is quite resilient and, and um, uh, in some ways more resilient than our cities and our communities, our clients' world, but we're pretty agile industry. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by our firm and our, and our colleagues uh, in the industry and, and how they've been adapting. I totally agree with you again, Joe. You know, designers are up for the challenge. This is what we do at heart. Uh, just the other day, I had a friend, I was explaining kind of what I do and what we're going through right now because she's not in this industry. And she said, wow, this must be a really exciting time for you. And I stopped for a minute and I said, you know, it is on, in some way, I said, I, I, that, sounds a, that sounds a little, I don't want to take, I guess sometimes excitement sounds like, hey, we're happy this is happening. And I don't think that's what was intended at all. What I said to her is, I have felt more on purpose than I have in a long, long time. I think when we are dealing with something that is this severe and this wide uh, reaching, when you can actually come up with solutions that really help to keep people safe, move design forward, that's a real uh, on purpose kind of feeling. And in, in that way, I think designers do feel uh, a sense of accomplishment with what they can solve for right now. And again, it's not to be a, interpreted as a, a win for that single person. It's really a, a win for humanity, <laughs> so to speak. But um, that's what designers do. They, no, the, the, mission, the mission becomes quite clear, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. I mean, you, you have to find a silver lining in this if there can be one, right? And right. you know, if designers in the design community are problem solvers, I think challenges that we're seeing right now is really gonna help lead to even more innovation. And sometimes, you know, as a community, we need that little push to like, you know, move us forward. And, you know, cause I think we all get stalled a little bit, right? And, you know, I mean, you would hate to have something like a pandemic to sort of help us move forward in this way. But, you know, once again, these challenges really, really, you know, the amazing things, the amazing ideas, the amazing, you know, innovation come out of periods like this. They really do, you know, and this isn't, even though this is probably the most, one of the more dramatic things that we all have experienced in our lifetime. And just going back to design as a solution, you know, I think it's so easy for people that are not in the design industry to think that design is really all about what looks pretty or beautiful. And obviously that's an, a, a very important facet of, and it's a, it's a cue to want to engage. When we find things attractive or interesting, we want to kind of lean into those. But design is fuller dimension than that. It is about problem solving. It's about innovating. It's about taking things to a whole new place and doing it in very beautiful ways. Absolutely. Well, Joe, I wanted to go back to something you sort of touched on earlier. So how are you mapping out how to maintain the original intention of a space? So whether it's your own offices the, of your clients or, you know, base camp that you worked on originally, um, while addressing some of the more immediate needs that, you know, so that people can get back to the workplace. Well, it's interesting. Um, our own studios, base camp, and all of our clients all have a, a very different work styles, very different work cultures. So they are all in different places and when this started and when, when we come out of it. And we'll come out of it, I think, quite gradually. For, for most of us, there's an eagerness to get back to work, not because it was so magical, but we miss our colleagues. We miss the human side of, of our, our of most, of, most knowledge workers have a connection to the people, right? So that's what we miss, we miss humans. Um, even though we see each other, that's not the same as having contact and, and um, you know, getting all the body language and, 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 and quite clearly the innovation and, and problem solving is best when there is a group. So we, we are all in the sort of the place matters business, place matters. Um, so because place matters, we look at why, why do we have these workplaces? And this is a question that even our, it's in the press, but certainly our own clients like, do we need an office anymore? Like this seems to be working okay. I'm like, well, yes, it's, it's okay. We're surviving, we're running, I think on momentum, frankly, but did you grow market share? How was your recruiting? Did you build backlog in your business? Um, 
you know, were you, did you, did you learn and train new people? Um, did you roll out new pr quality programs by Zoom? Uh, probably not. So we were able to get by, but I think there's still a lot missing. So in that regard, I think the, the basic premise of workplace still has not changed, even though we've got a lot of changes to the workplace, um, but we still fundamentally provide settings and context and tools and variety and postures for people and individuals, um, organizations to do their most effective work to achieve their mission. That's still what workplace is. How they do that is, that's the why, right? Then the, the how they do it is what's gonna start to change and adapt, and we are doing that. So um, ultimately, in, in designing for workplace, we solve for behavior. What are the new behaviors then that you need in the workplace today that we didn't have before? And for some, it will be going back to things that are quite familiar, and others, it's gonna be quite different. It means like, you know, I'm not gonna go back to the office for a place to focus. I'm gonna only go there when I connect with people or I can't get work done at home because of that puppy. Uh, so I have, to, or, the, or my kids are in school, so my partner's watching and we have, we have life changes that require me to have a different setting for me to be effective. And I think we ha now have much more permissive business culture for us to have that kind of flexibility and those choices and frankly that trust. We certainly tested the tools. So when we think about workplaces where, you know, ult ultimately I, I like Stuart Brand's old quote, uh, like. Buildings are predictions and predictions are wrong. <laughs> so the, the best way we can address the prediction of what a workplace should be, the behaviors in a workplace, is to design for multiple outcomes, multiple views, multiple visions of what the future looks like, multiple predictions. That's what used to be called scenario planning or scenario development. And now we think about it just being really much more agile and much more resilient in as people and as spaces. So those are the features that we're trying to build back in when people think about going back to work. Our roadmap is looking first at safety and comfort, psychological and physical, material health, uh, the safe commutes, safe movement in an office. But the next or the, in the near is, um, what are we going back for? And do you find that you have to sort of change the conversation that you're having with your clients so that they understand that it's really, that the now is obviously very important for them. And I know that's the most immediate, but, but because of what happened today, you do need to think about what's the near and the next. Um, what's that education process like? Well, it's uh, right now, because we don't know what near looks like. Uh, this is, you know, there, it's, it's still guessing. So this is where we, we start to lay out possible scenarios. And with our clients, we start to get some agreement on what they want to act on or decide not to act. Like, let's just wait. Can we wait for a while? And some clients are saying, we're not going to talk about this until September. At that point, we'll know a little bit more about vaccine. We'll know about therapeutics. We'll know about back to school. And then we can start to talk about it. So if things can be paused, things were paused. But as many you know, some projects have to go on. You know, leases still expire in good times and in bad. Um, buildings are sold. Mergers and acquisitions still happen. The economy goes up and it goes down. So those affect employment, and, and employment is what drives workplace. So, uh, so there are still changes, even though we're, we're trying to wait. There are still things that we have to react to. On the education side, what we're starting to do is try and, you know, a client's, it's, it's their own prerogative to figure out what they want to build, of course. Our, our real job is to put hopefully really viable options in front of them and tell them what the consequences are of some of these different decisions. So when we were laying out, a, a client asked us to put out a, a number of scenarios that we should or teach them about for them to consider when building, not just adapting the projects that they have already completed, but the ones that are on their drawing board to open up in a couple of years. So we've talked about four different scenarios and, and my colleague Fred Schmidt and I worked on a paper and he, he named these scenarios somewhat cleverly but one is called play ball which is this is a scenario where the virus gets knocked out and we more or less go back to the way things were. Uh, we have a pause it's going to be the, the you know the economy has to come back up but it's basically going to get knocked out. Then the other one is sort of the David Boy the Chicha changes thing where where this is a scenario where it remains an ongoing threat almost like the seasonal flu and it has to be sort of managed, um, but it's a, it's a manage, somewhat manageable health threat by, by most. In that regard, we'll have to make some changes to the workplace. 
obviously mechanical systems and sanitation are these are the kinds of things we're going to think about public transportation is a big part of that the next one is the um is playing defense which is sort of like the defense wins championships where we we say you know what there is no preventive or therapeutics we're we're kind of in that state now this we're what happens if, if this state that we're in keeps going for a while? Well, then the issue is probably more about real estate than it is about design. Like, do we need an office? Do we need an office in downtown versus suburbs? Do we need lots of small offices? Can we be in co-ops? Like, what does work look like in, while we are waiting for those other things to come along? And the last and the sort of the doom and gloom one is, is the Mad Max, where he jokingly says, you know what, someone's going to, you know, point a gun to your head for gasoline, or the currency goes awry and the healthcare systems is, is on its knees. Well, we're not gonna design for as though nothing happens, the first scenario. We've already designed that, right? And we're not gonna design for Mad Max because we're too hopeful for that. So Mindy, obviously, you know, shifting gears a little bit to include you in the conversation. You know, I understand at Interface, you've been really leading the conversation around designing for distance and really exploring how flooring can fit into that and how it can help solve the current needs of a space, but obviously how to evolve with design over time. So how can flooring support the return to office, um, to the office, and how can those changes really endure or even be flexible um, based on, of course, what Joe is saying, all these different types of scenarios in the future? You know, um, the floor actually plays a major role in architecture, if you think about it. Architecture is full of all these different planes, and some of them are quite substantial. The one above us, the ones beside us, the one below us. And, uh, you know, a lot of designers have always used the floor as a major design element. Sometimes we also use it to be kind of a backdrop to other things. But the point is, that plane in architecture, one thing I find so interesting about it is it's actually the only surface in architecture, major surface that is, that we're held to by gravity. So there has to be some sort of innate connection to the floor that's a little bit different than the relationship to the others. Not to say the others aren't important because it's really an all-encompassing experience. But we have this, this ability to use the floor to really give us uh, cues and prompts. And it, it has already been doing that. You know, when you think of things like wayfinding, um, sometimes we see that, you know, predominantly in healthcare, predominantly in transportation, but you also see it in uh, corporate offices, in universities. And this really is uh, kind of an extension, a, a deepening or a richening of what the experience of wayfinding is. Instead of uh, using the floor from a wayfinding standpoint to get you from point A to point B. It, it's to get you from A to B, but also to help get you there more safely. So at Interface, we have um, this idea, this concept that we are exploring with our customers that we call designing for distance. And it's really rooted in uh, a lot of the guidelines that have come out of, from the CDC around the six feet dimension. You know, that's a, a health protocol that they feel uh, will help give enough space between individuals to keep them physically safe. But the interesting thing about that dimension is that it's not so far apart that we can't still connect. And I think a lot of what Joe was saying about that need for social connection, even in our workplaces, is still very, very important. And I think a lot of us really got sad when this all hit because it was like, ah, oh, we're never gonna be able to socially connect again. I hope that's not true, and I don't think that's what will be true. I think we will figure out a way to do it safely, and starting with this physical distancing is one way to do that. You know, so how we are implementing that at interface and with our customers is by working uh, with the customers uh, uniquely, because everybody's experience will be different. Uh, where they are in their planning stages, what they define uh, as preferences from an aesthetic standpoint, what their budget is. You know, there's a lot of things that can weigh in on how we tailor something for someone. But at the root of it all, what we're using uh, really is elements in the floor, whether that, and it doesn't have to be super prescriptive. I think, you know, when Joe was talking about the now, that immediate address, what we saw as a response from a lot of people, uh, especially in our grocery stores and our convenience stores, we saw people putting tape down on the floor to mark the six foot 
uh, dimension or an arrow to say this is a unilateral cord or not a bilateral cord. Or, and, you know, we might still see some of that happening in the, the very short term. That's a temporary solution. But what we aspire to is that, much like what I was saying earlier, how, um, you know, design responds and design can solve for things in very beautiful ways. So we feel that things like elements like color and pattern and texture can be worked into the floor based on the dimensions that we need. Because if you think about what we have at Interface, we have a very flexible modular grid that can be tailored to fit a need, but it also can flex to fit a moment. So if we need to you know, retract into a moment and then change it back to the way that it was, we can very easily do that. And because it's based in mathematics, we can set dimensions to where these elements of color or pattern show up uh, close to that six feet dimension. For us, it would be metric. You know, we are a metric company. So we would be working probably around a two meter uh, point. So um, beautiful lines of color might show up that start to represent that. Or there might be some sort of detail in a corridor that naturally kind of cues the brain to want to push to one side or another and it starts to part people as they're you know, traveling down a corridor perhaps. Um, and it doesn't have to be uh, super prescriptive or very strong. You can even use texture. You, know, you can have a textural shift that's based on these dimensions. And if the users of the space are informed that that's what they're there for, they can use that, uh, you know, into, not just intuitively, but intellectually to, as a reminder to help them use the spacing on the floor, to help them move through space safely, to help them space apart from one another safely. And that can even extend on out to things like zoning and neighborhooding that can help keep uh, a group of people safer by lowering their risk and helping them to kind of stay within one place. That's a, a very long way of saying that we have these, this opportunity to use beautiful design elements in a very functional mathematical way to help with physical distancing. How can flooring support the return to work now and how can those changes really endure or flex in the future? Well, a lot of this will, will be specific to each customer. And so we need to be thinking about the uh, solutions that are unique to them. And so a lot of the things that I've been mentioning just now around how we design for distance with elements in the floor, we can help you with that. We actually have a whole team of designers that are ready to assist and help you think through your process, think through what works for your short-term needs as well as your long-term needs. So keep that in mind uh, that we can help out with that as well. Well, it kind of goes back to this idea that we, we talked about earlier about problem solving, right? In terms Absolutely. of you know, using design to problem solve. And it's, it's great that both of you obviously are offering tools to your clients you know, to really help solve these issues you know, whether it's sort of what is in the palette of interface or obviously for Joe, I mean, Perkins and Will, you spoke about it earlier, but Perkins and Will literally created a roadmap to return this, this very comprehensive, but, you know, ever changing, correct, sort of listing of guidelines that, that you can share with the, your, both your clients, but it seems like, cause it's on your website, something really that you're sharing with sort of the global community because everyone has these questions and, no, and not that we all have the answers as of yet, but it's great to sort of have the ability to have a place where you can have this dialogue in a, in a document in a way that's maybe palatable that people can understand. Okay, here's some ideas for, for how you deem the now, the near, and the next, or sorry, the next. Yeah. Well, we, you're right. We, it has been updated a couple almost in some early on it was updated once a week as soon as cdc or world health organization gave an update we would do an update um but you're right that's something that we've given out to everybody we've given it to our clients so uh, but it's it is free for everyone in the industry anyone that can tap into our website and get that and then there's i think we're up to 38 or so micro sites that deal with back to campus back to k-12 what does sports and rec look like in the future assembly spaces um, arts spaces and galleries so those are spaces that require their own unique roadmap um, and we're tackling those and putting out ideas to keep the conversation going so that collectively we're all doing a better job at, at, at tackling this new problem so 
Interface is leading by example, and they're embarking upon the redesign for distance of their very own Atlanta headquarters. So Mindy, I know when you guys set about to design your new headquarters back in 2017, 2018, when it first opened, which of course you finally called the base camp, you guys are the need to bring a sense of community back to the interface workforce. Not only were you renovating your physical workspace, but obviously you sought to renovate the way you were working. And of course, I think now in 2020, that statement seems incredibly apt of course, and um, as you probably now look how to bring your employees back to work in the post-pandemic world. So, you know, both for Interface um, and, of course, Perkins and Mill, who designed the, the first iteration of Basecamp and, and looking to the future, it might, be, it might be nice to just sort of touch on what was the original goal of sort of, of Basecamp when it opened back in 2018? And, you know, did it maintain the original mission of Interface, which obviously was about sustainability and biophilic design and resiliency, resiliency, choice and connection? Well, and, you know, Joe may want to jump in on some of this as well, too. But, you know, when we designed Basecamp, we knew that we wanted to do it differently and we wanted to find a better way to work and uh, a way that would increase productivity, uh, ease uh, the, the creative process, support collaboration, and Perkins and Will did a fantastic job at even kind of pushing us into what that next version of our office space would be. And, you know, up until COVID hit, not only did we get the opportunity to really experience this, because, you know, this was really the first time that we got to not just talk about how the future of the workplace works, we got to show how it works through our experience. So we had lots of customers, uh, people within the industry and outside the industry uh, wanting to come and see this experience. And so when COVID hit, um, you know, I think it probably crossed all of our minds as to, well, what does this mean for base camp? And after we kind of all, you know, let the dust, the dust settle just a little bit, uh, what we're all realizing, and, and even through conversations with Joe and Perkins and Will, because they are going to be working with us on this again, is that we want to continue to be a leader and, and help pioneer the way of what the next version of the, the future of the walk, workplace could look like, where there still is collaboration, but just done in a different way, a safer way. So I don't think it's the death of collaboration or maintaining social connection. We just need to find a new way to do it. Joe, I don't know if you want to add into any of that. Well, well I, Joe, uh, uh, go ahead, Helene. No, I was I was going to sort of lead you in because Joe, it'd be really interesting to see from your perspective for Perkins and Will, sort of what is the evolution of the space for Interface. Well, the interesting thing about Basecamp is it was designed to be a pilot, and it would never be done. So it was it was really you know, there was no precedent for it within interface and, and frankly a lot of the things that about the customer experience dealing with product teaching about sustainability to the local and the business community the A&D community teaching students um, how to teach the idea of systems thinking design thinking. Um, that was all part of the premise the premise of, of a base camp was that good things happen when people get together. And when they need get together, they need information and they are best to get information from each other by exchange. So it was designed for interaction. Um, now we took a guess on what kind of interactions might need to be back to these predictions, predictions about what kind of settings should we have that are, some are social, some are private, some that are quiet, some that are loud, some that are dark, some that are light, that variety, choice, tools, and trust were the sort of these under, under these principles and that, and that we could re that we could adjust those as needed on a per floor basis or on a on a neighborhood basis or over time basis. Of course, interfaces in a, is in an industry where there tends to be seasons seasons for either client engagement or for product rollouts and for de design shows and launches and such. Um, so it it has to flex, and it was designed to be quite agile, but is also designed to never be done. So when they went for lead platinum, when they went for well and they went for uh, heavy emphasis in, in biophilic systems, and they believe in inquiry. So Carnegie Mellon and others are looking at this all the time saying, what's our utilization look like? What's our energy look like? What's our water look like? What is our satisfaction level? What's our effectiveness? Let's teach ourselves what's, what's what we know, what do we know about this place? How can we make it better? And how can we share that with customers in the industry? 
and then we'll get even better yet. So if let's just assume that it's never done, it's a continuum and it can always be better. And things will change, you know, some assumptions change like this COVID, but, but the commitment to, to changing it hasn't, is, in fact, it was designed for this. It was designed for change. Yeah. Well, it seems like Interface had a crystal ball and sort of <laughs> knew already that they had to have a flexible, adaptable, versatile space when first moving into to Basecamp. So you guys, thank you so much. I know that we've We've tackled some really big ideas and really big issues today, and you can only really scratch the surface um, within 30 minutes. Um, and we all know that this is going to be an ongoing conversation that as a community, we're going to continue to have. Um, but with that, I certainly would love to thank you both for your time and your insight. Um, and for our audience, I would love you to please check out the Interface website and blog and really get updated on their ideas for distancing. And please also check out Perkins and Will and their roadmap to return. Thank you all. This is Helene Oberman, Managing Director of Interior Design Magazine, and I'd like to welcome you to Product Tour. This is our series that looks at the products and trends grabbing the industry and in real time, looking at the minds behind the design. So what do you get when you mix a trusted Southern brand who's focused on mindful manufacturing and sustainable practices, always meets the performance needs of commercial interiors with a hardworking Midwestern company who puts their design clients at the forefront by developing solutions through their innovative, design-driven products, a long-lasting, fruitful partnership that has created award-winning textiles. Being forward thinkers is not new to these collaborators, and we are here to learn more about the next generation of bleach-cleanable, sustainable performance fabric that is certainly much needed in today's current world. To discuss the launch of C.F. Stinson's Balanced Collection with Sombrella Shore, I'd love to welcome Lori Roop, Design Director for CF Stinson and Alan Hopps, Market Manager for Sombrella Contract. Thank you guys so much for being here. I really appreciate it. So Alan, can you really tell us about the evolution of this partnership between Sombrella Contract and CF Stinson? Sure. Uh, Helene, it, it started in uh, 2010 and uh, Glenn Stinson and I were both attending a NADFD meeting out in California and we had our uh, new Summerla contract program, uh, all but complete and ready to go to market, but we needed a partner. And so I knew Stinson was uh, very focused on healthcare and we felt like our product due to the performance attributes were uh, perfect for healthcare. So um, I got with Glenn there uh, during that uh, conference and we had dinner and we discussed uh, our companies and our product offerings and our philosophies to go into market. And I think we both found that um, we were uh, both working with uh, very innovative companies and we all, we wanted to drive technology as well. So it was like a, a perfect match. And that's really, really where our um, relationship started uh, for, and has progressed to where it is today. And it's really was the launch of Sombrella Contract as well, correct? That is correct. It was the launch of Sombrella Contract, and it was also the, of the launch for our Defiance product, uh, which is our antimicrobial option that's available on our performance fabrics. And so, I mean, it's great that, you know, obviously CF Stinson was your very first partner and obviously has ob continued in the last 10 years. Um, it'd be interesting to sort of discuss. So maybe Lori, this is for you more, but like what were the first collections? So I know Alan, you touched on it, but what were some of the first collections that you guys developed together? Um, the very first collection that we worked on together was called Daydream and um, sort of aesthetically, it really had kind of a lighthearted carefree spirit. And then um, the second one was Big Sur, which we really tried to capture um, the energy of the Pacific coastline. But I think looking back on it now, I think what we really did and did a pretty good job of is um, establishing a really nice foundation for 
um, umbrella contract for the stints in line so that designers who are coming to us looking for that brand new technology would have a choice. They'd have a, a really snappy looking plane, a smart looking stripe, a large geometric, a small. So we kind of tried to round it out basically to offer a full breadth of options for our customers. And did you find early on in this partnership that there was sort of a big education process for the design community? Did it like just make sense automatically? I, I think they got it pretty early on. And I think that's probably because they were looking for this type of product anyway. And so we were really responding to the market needs. So um, I, don't, I don't think it was too complex and it's fairly easy to um, take down the tech talk in chemistry talk into something that's really digestible for everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, certainly 10 years later, you're now launching Ashore, which I have to say is incredibly fortuitous if you think about the timing of it all. But I mean, Alan, sort of what was the impetus for the development of Sombrella Ashore? Because um, I'm assuming it's been long in the making. Uh, yes, it has. And uh, it's really twofold. Um, I'd say first, we, over the last 12 to 18 months, we've had a lot of customers coming to us on the Sunbrella contract side, looking for product that would meet healthier hospitals. And then can you just walk us through some of the specific features that um, make up the Sunbrella Assure so that designers understand what they're getting when they specify that type of product? Assure is a technology that we apply to our fabrics that enhances the performance of our fabrics. And uh, the main feature is fluorine free, which is, uh, contains water repel and stain resist. And one of the other features is also our bio-based part of the compound, which is a high percentage uh, of it is taken from non-plant, uh, non-food plants. And I guess one of the other larger things is the indoor outdoor part of it, which is um, something that's uh, that you have to have with our umbrella products and so it resists UV and it's bleach cleanable and it's easy to clean and I also should say it withstands uh, most all the disinfectants on the market today uh, except for phenols so it's a uh, very powerful there as well. So I know you kind of touched on it but can you give us our give the audience a little more insight so I know this came out of what you're calling, I'm going to read this, that Healthier Hospitals Initiative to meet the Healthy Interiors goal of the Safer Chemicals Challenge. So can you sort of translate that to the layman designer? So, so their initiative is to simply remove five chemicals from any uh, product that's purchased in furniture or furnishings uh, that are going into the hospitals. Uh, and we, we met four of those initiatives uh, right up front, uh, but one we didn't, and that was fluorine. So the, the five chemicals that they're really focusing on and targeting are formaldehyde, fluorine, PVC, fire retardants, and antimicrobials. And they want to get those out. And honestly, I like this approach to uh, eliminating chemicals or managing chemicals. Uh, one thing is it's very simple. And... They, uh, they allow the manufacturers to really focus down uh, really tight and get those chemicals out. And I think that's an advantage versus some of the long lists that are out there today that you really have to spend a lot of time uh, working through and maybe not being able to come up with the products that they need at the end of the day. So I think the short list is really a very focused, good way to try to get some chemicals out of some of these products. Um, well, certainly there's the technology behind the collection, but Lori, I think we want to get into some of the great ideas about what's the design inspiration for this collection. I know that you're up in Maine and it looks like it was, that may have been <laughs> inspiration for this. Yeah, I think our locale, our really great locale often influences where we're coming from. Um, just to back up a little bit, I think that some Sombrella was on the same path that we were before we even started talking where we were feeling like Healthier Hospitals Initiative was becoming a very important initiative for our customers. And so we were also trying to find ways to approach that. Um, and I think um, the kind of wellness thrust in the marketplace for all markets, hospitality, healthcare, um, education and contract 
has has been pretty broad. And so we're always trying to find ways to address um, this kind of wellness interest that people have. And so I think we've come across different ways, but to go straight into Healthier Hospitals Initiative, we really needed a partner um, to kind of work through how to get that fluorine out of the, the steam repellent. And luckily we're able to partner with Sombrella, which we love doing, and um, work together kind of on that final mile, which was kind of more like a year maybe, Alan, I think the final mile was long. Sure. Um, I love that year. Yeah, so I think that, you know, coming from that wellness uh, kind of theory or perspective, I think that kind of drove the look of the collection aesthetically. So um, I think we, we pulled in a lot of biophilic principles, which is something, <clears throat> excuse me, interesting for us and also fits in nicely with our locale, like you're talking about. I mean, we're 10 minutes from the beach. We're actually on a river. So four loons greeted me this morning on the way into work. And like, you know, there's just a lot of flora fauna everywhere. So I think that we, it's easy for us to kind of tap into those biophilic principles and, um, you know, not get too scientific with it, but kind of offer something that's very pleasing and has an uplifting um, wellness feeling to it, thus the name balance. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, we absolutely understand sort of the power of biophilia and how it provides a healthier environment that, you know, can induce well-being, whether it's healthcare, to your point, education or hospitality or, or a workplace. But, you know, it really seems like you have used that as inspiration for even your previous collections, right? Like you really like that tenant in terms of the practices you do for your designs. Yeah, I think so. I think that we um, we kind of gravitate towards that. It's an area of interest for us. Um, and like personally, I think it feels right for us. And also I think it's a way as designers to kind of put something personal in into it and have a point of view. So it's not just, uh, straightforward geometry or something like that. I think you, you, you pull in a point of view as well. And I mean, have you seen sort of the progression of like some of the early collections that you've done um, to like what balance looks like now, even in terms of like the biophilia that you're designing or um, the inspiration behind it? Yeah, I think we're learning um, how to gain confidence in that arena and, and really come forward with product that people respond to favorably right off, off the bat. So like with those first two Sombrella collections, I think the designs are fabulous, but it was time to kind of push forward um, design-wise and, and come with something that feels very modern and also um, a little bit personal as well. So yeah, I think there has been a great evolution um, and hopefully for the Stinson line in general, I think, you know, over the past 10 years, we've, we've changed a lot and really kind of tried to become a very design focused company. And do you also see like there's sort of the change though too, because I think with that first collection that you were designing, like you had healthcare in mind. Now, even if you have healthcare in mind now, you're understanding that that these textiles might be specified for a lot of different sectors. So do you also feel like that will really shape how you're designing? Yeah, I mean, I think that a perfect collection is very appealing to everybody in every, every sector. So while you know, keeping healthcare in mind, um, I think that we did broaden the look a lot and really kind of visualize the patterns in different types of spaces. And also, especially with the color, the colors that we came forward with, um, you know, maybe something for, um, you know, you might want something very sophisticated and, okay, this is where this is going to get pretty authentic because I don't have the final samples. I never get them. Um, but there's something kind of, um, calming and soothing here. This is going to be great in healthcare, but, um, also if you wanted, you know, something with a lot, lot of pop for maybe hospitality, you've got this kind of color available to you, which almost feels very like fresh, modern, Scandinavian almost, where it's just, you know, you can picture it in other kinds of interiors beyond healthcare. So we try to straddle both. Oh, all, actually, all four. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, sort of what is your, even just with your color, what is your sort of design process like? I mean, do you start with an image in your mind? Or are you always carrying around a notebook? What, you know, what is, because we know it, it's sort of multi-stepped. I mean, it, you know, a design doesn't just appear out of anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the setup behind me is a lot of our color boards that we work with um, and a lot of our color 
uh, inspiration. So you can see we're pulling from fashion and just what's in the zeitgeist and design world at large, basically. So, you know, we're, we're taking all of that and then we try hundreds of color combinations um, with, with the mill and um, we start paring it down from a lot of options into what we think is going to cross over into the most markets. And again, like, you know, also the markets are changing. I mean, red used to be a big no-no in healthcare and now it's like those kind of bright primaries or fun color combination of pops are, are working in healthcare as well. So um, I think there's a lot of crossover, but also, you know, we do try to think specifically like, you know, education, make sure you have a really nice blue and, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it might be fun to sort of maybe let's dive into some of um, the specific designs and patterns that you have for the Balance Collection. So diving into the specific patterns of the Balance Collection, so what's the effect with the symmetry of mantra? Yeah, I mean, obviously there's a flower motif, so you're tapping into that biophilic principle, but also the more kind of obscure biophilic principle of kind of um, symmetrical geometry is, is very soothing and calming to people and kind of makes humans feel like all is right in the world, basically. So that's what, what kind of informed the approach of that flower shape and kind of making sure that it's very symmetrical all the way around. And then we can really make the yarns, the umbrella yarns and heathers kind of shine along with the color. And then sort of what are the references behind Serene? Okay, so Serene is a tough one to talk about because sometimes it sounds a little corny, but um, I'm going to do it anyway. I like it, go ahead. It's all but good. You're too much it. honor. You, it's all you. <laughs> so, um, I mean, the less corny interpretation is definitely like a calming landscape and that sort of grounding effect of a horizon line. But we sort of took it further into um, sunset. And so how, um, and that's the corny part, is that when you hear the word sunset, it sounds kind of bleh. But um, I think that who doesn't love a good sunset? Well, I think you're all good then. <laughs> I love sunset. Yeah, there we go. See, if Alan loves a good sunset, we all, oh, we all do. And I actually, to be honest right now, and I don't think there's anything corny about it, I mean, especially given the specific time right now where like, you know, access, well, even right now, but even in the future, if you're in a, in a healthcare facility and you don't have necessarily easy access to the outdoors, like maybe that's something that you crave is I haven't seen a sunset in a long time. I've been in this facility for, for a long treatment and you know what? And, and, and that, that's okay. Like, I think that is needed and necessary and, you know, they might have their own interpretation anyways. Yes, I think there's a lot of free association with this collection, definitely yeah. with the imagery. But I think that Serene does a nice job in kind of capturing that ombre effect of a sunset, which can, it just speaks to us. It, it stops us in our tracks every time we see a beautiful sunset. So whatever, we just have to go with that. Yeah. Um, and I, <laughs> I think that kind of offsetting the different ombres, I think um, it, it makes it more modern and is going to make it look really exciting on furniture pieces. So then, of course, there's the flower power of Thrive. <laughs> yeah, so there's the free association. So it can, you, you know, if you see a flower, I love it. If you see a starburst, I love it. If you see a sunshine, that's awesome. It's all, it's all good. It's all positive um, imagery and kind of projects that kind of optimism um, behind me. Yeah, mm -hmm. is uh, Lauren, um, Lauren, our senior designer's beautiful um, hand drawn, uh, hand cut out artwork on white paper. And then um, as she took it into the computer, worked out the repeat in the CAD program. And then finally, some of the exciting colorways of um, Thrive you can see there. So, like, you know, maybe in the pink colorway, you just see a flower and it, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's an optimistic pattern. Um, and no, and I, to your point about Lauren and her hand, cut out like pieces I love and when I have the opportunity to see you I mean that's something that's always great to see is the fact that you know you guys do start with original artwork that you then slowly adapt and then of course if you know it goes through the steps of like CAD drawing and then you know ultimately becomes the fabric but it's always nice to see like the hand of both you and Lauren and then how it turns into 
an ultimate textile. But moving on, of course, because then we have the constellations of sync, correct? Yes, so um, that design could have quickly become a confetti powder and we really didn't want that. We, we, the inspiration was really a nighttime sky and stars in the sky and constellations. So I think that um, the design does keep that kind of higher aesthetic. So it has a beautiful heathered background with these kind of um, spots of color. And then if you look, they really kind of um, come together to form almost like a Milky Way pattern or a rivulet pattern. And then, of course, there's the repeat, right, of Bliss? Yes. So, I mean, Bliss is a, just a really functional stripe, but I think that it has, um, you know, a lot of color play in it, a lot of color highlights in it. And I think that us humans find a lot of um, restfulness and peace when we see these kind of somewhat predictable patterns like stripes. I mean, again, it just it just kind of balances you and, and keeps you focused and there's no uh, crazy surprise of jarringness. And of course, there's the last. So there's like a specific texture that one can find in season, correct? So like, how did you guys capture that? So, I mean, it, it might be rudimentary, but I think that the original inspiration was kind of leaf rubbings that you do as a, as a child. Um, and so that was the start of season. Um, but then it, it was coming out a little too veiny, actually, and we didn't really want that reference, especially for our healthcare fabrics. So we actually pulled the texture from one of our woven fabrics, and that became um, the texture in the in the leaves that sort of resembles, you know, veins, but it's not veins. And just by collaging uh, photocopies of that texture and kind of turning the texture in different directions, we kind of worked out how we wanted that pattern to look. That's great. Well, I appreciate that sort of overview of all of like the balance collection. But Alan, of course, we haven't forgotten about you over there. I'm all good. I'm, I'm enjoying it. I know. It. Well, no, but like, you know, just like circling back to because, you know, certainly, you know, while the, the collection might be sort of for or focused on the healthcare industry, you know, obviously the specific needs that people need in that industry are now really coming to the forefront and more commercial settings, whether it's for the workplace or for hospitality, for education. And so how really can Assure meet the needs of both healthcare and all these other sectors? Uh, yes, well, um, I think uh, where we really can, they can benefit is gonna be uh, bringing in performance fabrics uh, into, into other markets. So healthcare has obviously been uh, focused on performance fabrics for a long time and all the disinfecting that goes on. Uh, they had to have product that would stand up to that, which we have been able to provide and Stinson has been a large provider of that uh, into the marketplace. Uh, but I think the, the comfort level is where Assure and the Summerla contract is going to thrive with, uh, with the other markets. And I say that because the disinfecting that's going to take place going forward in these other markets um, is going to be done by companies that are not used to disinfecting. So I can see uh, the, all the base disinfectants causing problems with fabrics uh, because they may not know how to manage that. And so this product in the balance uh, collection is going to offer them something that if they make a mistake and they put the wrong disinfectant on it, it's not going to ruin the fabric. And they'll also be able to get those those the stains out of that fabric from the disinfectant sometime. So I think that's how it, it's gonna spill over and how Assure and some of the contract and the balance collection can, can uh, help uh, those markets that are not used to disinfecting and cleaning. Yeah, no, I mean, like I said earlier, I mean, it's just fortuitous in terms of the timing with you guys launching this collection and launching the technology behind Assure because I think sort of the safety of our environments now, obviously. I think, you know, we like to hope that everyone was cleaning before, but I think now it's, you know, that's gonna be sort of at the forefront because really this idea of health and wellness in all of our environments has been sort of an ongoing conversation and now looking forward to what that actually means and how that's gonna be translated into future designs in all these sectors. Um, obviously, you guys have a 10-year relationship, which has been really amazing in terms of how you guys have 
brought some really great collections to the forefront and to the industry as a whole. What are you guys talking about now for your sort of next partnership? Laura, you want to you want to start that one off, or? Oh sure. I mean, <laughs> we love working with the Sombrella people. I mean, not only is the product just best in class, but the people really are fabulous, um, and we love working with them. So at this point in everybody's career. Uh, we definitely want to stick with people we like working with, for sure. Um, but I think, you know, as the situation in the world evolves, there seems to be, I'm feeling new questions and new challenges every day. And I think that I can't necessarily predict all of them, but I think that Sunbrella is, is going to be a great partner um, to figure out all of all of these ongoing day-to-day -day questions that we're, we're all fielding right now. And, and I'll just add, you know, because of... Uh... Uh, what we said earlier about the, the innovation um, heritage at, uh, at CF Stinson and at Sumbrella, uh, we are already looking at some things uh, that we can do together from a technology standpoint. Uh, we're, not, we're not quite ready to talk about those yet, but uh, we are looking at some, uh, some potential possibilities uh, in the near future. So that's, that's really exciting that we continue to partnership as we go forward. And you know, obviously, I you guys have a great relationship, but do you, moving forward, Alan, also see Assure is being used on other collections with some of your other partners as well? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we we absolutely see Assure being a, a, a finish with our products that will go across all markets. So it will go across residential. It will go across outdoor. Um, you know, contract is always a a, a good place to to bring technology to the table because it's usually demanded there first. So this is the opportunity that we have here with, uh, with Stinson. Uh, but we see it uh, being spread across all our product lines before, uh, before too, too long. Yes. And so I'm just curious then, does that mean that any of the current sort of products and any of these collections where you have these partnerships can use Assure or is it only sort of new new collections and products moving forward? Well, certainly we, it's, uh, it's gonna be easier for us to start the uh, programs with, with new programs uh, with Assure, um, but I'm sure we'll be having some conversations with, with our uh, customers that may want to make a conversion. So, um, so I think we will, we will be able to have a conversation on both of those. No, because I'm, you know, just obviously what Assure is made up of certainly is something that really is going to meet the needs of what people are asking for now, given the current crisis and obviously how people are going to be adapting design. So it'd be really interesting to see. But of course, you know, Alan and Lori, really appreciate your time today. Really appreciate your insight, of course, into the New Balance collection, into sort of the new Assure technology. And for our audience out there, you know, I really hope that you check out both Balance and Sumbrella Assure. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. The smartphone. How did we ever live without it? And now it has become a powerful tool for all you designers and architects. Interior Design is excited to introduce Launch, a new feature right inside the magazine that's built around the smartphone. Launch allows for the speed and efficiency of a digital platform while providing the inspiration and curation of a magazine. So you may ask, well, how does it work? Just point your phone at a launch code and it will activate a powerful, intuitive user interface. One in which you can instantly select from multiple actions, all at the touch of a button. Do you want to, say, download a spec sheet? How about contact a rep? Or just get a sample? Launch will help you discover the newest products in the market and easily take action. Now, keep your eye out for it. We are loving Launch.
Hey everybody, this is Cindy Allen, Editor-in-Chief of Interior Design. Now more than ever, we want to hear some good news and inspiration. And what better way than sharing some super cool ideas from a special student program called the FORM Student Innovation Competition by our friends at Formica. And I am delighted to chat today with the VP of Marketing and another friend, Amy Gath. How are you, Amy? I am great. It's great to be with you, Cindy. It's great to see you. Okay, so I'm really excited about this competition, um, the Forum Student Innovation Competition. Well, you know what I like so much is that I heard that it really started years ago in another way. And I think we always, um, when we dig back, we find these treasures. And I think you had one. So what had it been originally? Absolutely. So back in 2008, Formica did a challenge with the architectural greats, and it was called FORM. Um, also, the architectural challenge, contemporary architects at play. And we had folks like Zaha Hadid and Michael Graves and Massimo Vanielli um, create something you could sit upon, lie upon, or play upon out of Formica. I love and, that. Oh, I mean, amazing things that, that they came up with and I, so inspiring. Actually, we still have many of the pieces, one of the collections in our office, and it's so fun to walk around and see these pieces and this just, it, it's very inspiring. Um, so in 2018, we said we should repeat this with students um, as a tribute to the greats that we worked with a decade ago. Yeah, and you know, I remember um, the good old days, you know, there were the there would be these programs that these these projects that these that these architects and designers did what they designed were really like sculptures honestly they were they were works of art and it made and it made a lot of sense that you were doing it back then and now reimagining it for today which i love but i did you know something i something i noticed when i looked through all of the work uh, and i have a list here it was Peter Eiserman, Lorinda Speer, mm -hmm. um, is it Jaime Velez? Yes. With Jennifer Kolstad, Zahadid, Bill Peterson. This is amazing. Thomas Main, Buzz Udell, Michael Graves, Massimo Vignelli, and Bernard Schumi. Unbelievable. But when yes. I look through the projects and I look through all of their pieces, what was kind of interesting is how they all had their own interpretations, obviously, but also they used all different types of formica. So you must have said the world's your oyster and your world's, your world's formica and there was laminate and veneer and color core, color through solid surfacing. It was so exciting. Oh, it was, it was so amazing. And it is, I mean, Zaha, who we said you have an eight by eight box to play within and, and took up every inch of that eight by eight spot and and you know michael graves who created such a beautiful but simple fits right in i mean it it really was fun to see their personalities come to life in their work and don't you think it's funny so you said like there are these are there pieces or kind of miniatures in your office oh there's the real thing the big oh, the real pieces thing. yeah so you were walking by them <laughs> for all these years and then it's sort of like oh why don't we reimagine this idea right that's exactly right. And I think part of it was really spurred by so many of them had passed. And it was, you know, what a wonderful piece of history and, you know, what a way to pay tribute to these greats whose students are learning about and studying and admiring so much. So let's challenge students to do what, what the greats did to learn. Right, so tell them. us about, so tell us how you, um, how you sort of imagined what this could be and how you pushed it out to the student world. A absolutely. So I, I mean, this was a full on, right? We went to we went to universities across the US and Canada. We sent emails and we did, you know, we really got into the digital world where students right. are. And and you know, it was fantastic because we had some professors who said, you know what, I'm gonna make this my class final project. Um, Love that. And I think what has been fascinating to us is as we went into kind of lockdown across the country, a lot of students said, you know what, I, I want to do this now. And so we had just this waterfall of entries come in um, towards the end. And it was it was really inspiring. And it, it has just been so fun to go through them and see 150 entries 
um, 178 students all together, um, some group entries. So it was it was just really fun. And it was fun to have professors call and say, you know, uh, students need to remember how to work with different materials. And this really pushes the bounds of teaching design and teaching how to think about it. Right, exactly. And uh, yeah, I saw somewhere it was like 40 schools, which is unbelievable. First of all, I would like to say something. I love Formica. Can I just say that? Like, oh, thank you. I have used Formica in so many projects. I just love it. So I'm so glad that they get they got to like dig into it. And another thing, I, I wanted to thank you because you all um, produced our HIP awards last year. And we did have so much fun with that. And I wore my polka dots because we did that really cute polka dot HIP award and the designers loved it. So you're like, you know, you're that essential element that gives them um, freedom to imagine whatever they, they want. I, that's absolutely right. We loved doing the HIP Awards because it really gave us an opportunity to kind of push and try different things and show what the material could do. And, and that's what we wanted the students to do too, was push the boundaries, try something because you're not limited with laminate. And that was, that was very cool to see what they came up with. I love that, not limited with laminate. You got a whole new slogan <laughs> that I didn't know about. Fantastic. Okay, so we're going to play this kind of fun game, uh, you and I. Uh, yes. because there are 10 and we're going to go from 10 all the way to the winner. All right. Yes. And we're going to like play off each other. Okay. So you're number 10, Amy. Go. All right. All right. So our 10th place winner is called Geode Table. It is done by Brandon Freely from Marywood University. And I, we love this. Our judges love this. We had a fantastic panel of jur a jury panel um, because this table replicates a geode. So it's beautiful and then you open it up and it's incredible on the inside. So fantastic work, Brandon, congratulations. Yeah, it's great. I love that the, that the color was different on the inside, which made it like a surprise, right? Yes, and he used the metals on the inside. So it is kind of like a geo where it sparkles a little bit. Oh, that's true. I saw that purple. I thought that purple was kind of interesting too. Okay, yeah. so number nine, our ninth place, it's called the Nordic Chair. And it's by Gabrielle. The shape was beautiful. And yes. um, what she said was that the shape was a mixture between a circuit board and the growth of rings of a tree. And what a lot of the kids were saying, they were kind of playing with this idea of nature and technology, which was really fun. And she also liked the idea of using solar orange laminate, which I love. I love Yes. That. She said that the name was, was reminding of the northern landscapes and I don't know, sort of an iceberg. And I'm feeling chilly just even thinking about it. It, it I, was fabulous. And, and I really liked, I mean, I think it was a very kind of natural organic shape, but it also had kind of that tech influence to it. It did, which, it right, did. Super, super cool capturing that blurred lines theme. Yeah. yeah I love that one. Super, yeah. okay. So now what are we on to eight, number eight? We're on Go to eight. So, so eight was a team effort um, and it was from Algonquin University in Canada, a team of Huang Hong and Devanshi Gulati. And um, this is kind of a, a flexible moving part table. I love this um, because it's got the woods and then it's got yeah. the wood patterns and then it's got a felt and a bubbles laminate, mm -hmm. um, okay. which I, I think just the combination kind of really captured the blurred lines. But then I loved that it could expand and it had hidden storage. So That's I love the functionality too. Super smart. I mean, don't you love like these kids? They're like, you know, freedom of ideas and... They're going to make it happen. I, I do. And I, I like that too, because I was thinking, oh my gosh, that'd make my house look so much better. Like, that's fabulous. <laughs> there you go. You got some designers you could hire. Okay. Exactly. I need them. In seventh place, we have the Nia Table by Elaine Chow, and she's from Sheridan College. And she says it's the perfect combination of three geometric shapes, the circle, the rectangle, and the semicircle. So that was sort of her idea and this, this thinking about interchangeability and flexibility. And um, she liked, let me see what she said. She said she liked the Surface Set 2020 collection because this is so cute. She liked its humanistic sensibility, nature inspired hues like algae <laughs> and a future forward palette that blends synthetic design with natural as seen in the softwood collection. So she really like dug into what she wanted on that. 
which I love, I love that. And I, I really love the functionality of what she created because it's something that can be used vertically or horizontally. And I thought that was really clever and just perfect for kind of any space where you want to fit it. I, she did a fantastic job. Yeah, I didn't realize that, by the way. I know you're seeing, you were definitely way more in depth than I was, but I, now that you say that, I'm saying, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Looking at the images, that was super, that was a super fun idea. Okay. Yeah. We're up to sixth, sixth place, where it's getting, getting very, very exciting, everybody. I know it is. So sixth place is the Tech Shelf by McCall Podelsky from Weber State University. Weber State has been a participant in our competitions for many years. We've gotten great stuff from them. And, and this is a shelf that really helps folks kind of put their text, their tech stuff away and kind of step away and recharge and what i loved was it's beautiful kind of simple curving line i love that, I love that. Um, and then i love kind of the blonde cedar wood with these pops of color very fun yeah i like that they color blocked you know and they were color blocking in areas that you wouldn't normally think because they were doing it on the curve which yes. was so lovely right i which, take one of those I, they're it's fantastic yeah, and I, you know what I loved as as a person who loves laminate, I loved that they showed, you know, laminate can bend. It's not this kind of rigid material. It does have that flexibility. So I, I love that he used that too. Yeah, good job. Good job. Okay. Yeah. So now we're in fifth place and we have the okay. Imagination Bench by Allison Plunkett of Marywood University. I love all these schools. And if you think yes. about, you know, the next generation um, of designers, they're all over the place and they're thinking about you, they're thinking about for Mike, it's fantastic. So hers was very cute. She talks about her imagination bench, emulating the stages of life of a plant from germination and growth to pollination and seed spreading. Fabulous. Your ima imagination, Allison, is fantastic. But what I really loved about it were the strong lines mm -hmm. and the strong primary, she wanted matte colors. And matte is, I love, I love matte and formica. And yes. then she added this very creative, Allison, fantastic, this special touch of that um, marker board. Yes. And so that was the thing to me that was really exciting because she's showing, showing the kids on their writing. And that meant she really understood the range of what Formica has. I, I love that. And I loved kind of the flexibility of the bench too, with so many different things that you can do. It's, it's kind of like when your little kids get old toys and it, it kind of lets their imagination go wild. And I, I really like that about the imagination bench. I get kids using it in so many ways. Allison, congratulations. Great job. Okay. Now we're up to fourth place. Yes, and this is our second team in the top 10. It's called Duality by Matthew Lamb and Benjamin Ma from the University of Waterloo. Um, and, and this one's kind of similar in, in a way to the geo table in right. that, um, you know, it opens up to reveal something that was completely new and loved kind of the shape that was both natural, but also very kind of technical and really captured that and blurred lines. Um, theme really well. And, and they used our great kind of natural patterns, elemental stone, layered sand, planked urban oak. Yeah, don't you think that's kind of amazing too that, I mean, you had a series of judges, but you, this, the range is so varied from one person to the other, although there are hard themes that people are, are you know, very much passionate about these days. So it just shows mm -hmm. like you can do whatever you want and there's, there's a solution for it. Okay. So That's we right. have in third place, the G table by Jessica Reed, and she's from Marywood University. And uh, she, talks, she talks also, see that they're, they're very um, uh, probably passionate and conflicted at the same time about nature and technology, right? Yes. Yeah, so she's talking about the two separate entities functioning, she wants it to be harmonious. So uh, she has, she has it. I don't. What is this black crystal finish for Micah? What is that? So it's got a little bit of a sparkle, a little <laughs> bit of a gloss to it, um, which I think looks kind of technical, techy. Yeah. Um, right. So she wants. So she wants that to represent formality. Okay, I get that. And mm -hmm. then the white wash birch ply laminate represents nature for her. And then this is what's really interesting. She wanted to use copper, and the copper showed the most advanced in technology. And for her, it was electricity. 
And I just thought that was so, that was so clever. And she, yeah. she really brought together her thinking about nature and technology into this beautiful piece. So congratulations. That, number three, we're getting really close to the big winner. So number two is your, is your call, Amy. Yes. Oh, I'm so excited. And, and I will say that the top three we'll see at Neocon next year. So we didn't get to bring them this year, but they're coming next year. Oh my God, you know what's so funny you say that? Because I saw, I was reading somewhere that you're going to show them at Neocon. And I thought, oh, I hope it's more than just the winner. I hope it's a few of them. Fantastic. I love that. Yeah, so all, all our top three are coming to Neocon next Fantastic. year. Excited to see them. Um, so number two uh, is the post-industrial bookshelf from Jacob Ethier at Quebec University. And I mean, this is amazing. It's a big piece um, with these brilliant orange colors. And what I love is is the detail that he created in it. It's got hidden shelving, it's got these laser cut panels and you look at it one way and you don't see what's stored on the shelves and then you can kind of see on the sides. Um, and, and just the use of orange. I think it, orange is such a happy color. It just feels so good um, that this piece just feels good. And that's really what we heard from our judges. I, I'm crazy for this one, frankly. I think this one is, fantastic it's very sophisticated it shows somebody who really is is you know working on their language for for the future i love the hidden component as you said the orange crazy for the orange and the fact that they did this patterning on it right mm -hmm. yeah 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 which i mean another thing we we laminate people love too is just showing the kind of the level of detail you can get to in laminate so thank you jacob thank you so much it was fantastic, Jacob. I loved it. Congratulations. So drum roll, please. All right. Yeah. First place Yay. winner in the forum student innovation competition goes to Alexandra Clement from Jean Sur Richelieu, which is actually the uh, the place where Formica Canada started. Are you kidding? So, no. In the Canadian province of Quebec. Yes. That's crazy. Alexandra Clement, you are the first place winner and we are yes we are that that's kind of crazy yes i that was just uh, that was a crazy coincidence Absolutely. and amazing so fantastic and and alexandra is winning for the origami which is actually a desk and allows you to you know origami right now is really really in trend i have to say and there's something so beautiful and light and architectural. So when you can kind of get that mix right, which is what she did, that's why I'm sure the judges were responding to it. So it's a desk that plays with shapes and volumes and it causes the desk to challenge proportions. I love that, it moves, it opens. And yes. she was thinking that it could be a school desk or it could be a resi, residential desk, or even in an office, which as you can see, it could work in all of those. And it's sort of interesting. She she listed her for Micah all in French, which I would completely mangle, but I, I believe it is white layered sand, oiled oh. olive wood, and whitewashed birch ply. Did I get that right? You got that perfect, yes. <laughs> so tell us about the judges. Was it in-house? No, we had and uh, we had one fabulous in-house, which is Renee Hightree Darrington, our global uh, our global head of design for Formica. But then we had a, a really cool jury. So Leanne Ford, our great friend, oh, and yeah, so we were oh, excited yeah. to have her. Yeah. Um, Tristan Butterfield from oh, Gensler and Kohler um, was part yeah. of it. Cheryl Durst was oh on God, our jury. <laughs> yeah, next year you should be on our jury. All right. Uh, and then Vern Yip was also um, interior designer and television personality. So, I mean, just such a creative and cool group with amazing thoughts on design. So we really had fun with them. Do you remember what they said about uh, the first place winner about origami? I, you know what, I think just looking across the board, score, score top, of, top of the charts for yeah. creativity and functionality and really using the material in a unique and different way and and something that was so complicated but right. so simple right. um, it was truly beautiful well to all the top 10 a huge congratulations first of all look at the judges that were looking at your work which is amazing that for mike is supporting you and the fact that we're talking about you right now is kind yes. of 
fantastic. But there's, so we have that, uh, but there's some other good news that you want to share, um, Amy. So tell us about, um, tell us about it. That's right. So last year, actually about this time, um, Formica was purchased by a company called Broadview Holdings. And that brought to us two amazing sister companies, ARPA and Trespa. And ARPA has had this amazing product called Phoenix. It is a soft touch, super matte, anti-fingerprint, self-healing product. Oh, it feels so good, yes. Yeah. Um, it is it is a pedible product. It just feels so good. Pedible? Oh, I love that. Is that an yeah. Amy, Amy-ism? Pedible? It's an Amy-ism, yes. It's <laughs> pedible, um, which I appreciate also right now. It's kind of gross. We don't want to touch stuff, but you just have to touch this product. It's fabulous. Um, but it, it brought um, Phoenix, the Phoenix line to us. And so they are, Broadview is fantastic about innovation and sharing innovation and kind of technology transfer. And so we are now producing Phoenix here in North America in sizes for North American designers. You get it with kind of Formica speed and distribution. Um, and we are just thrilled to be able to launch this gorgeous line because it is, it is truly beautiful. That's fantastic. So I, so I understand it's in a nice color range, 16 colors, I think right now. 16 yeah. colors. That's right. Um, 16 colors of a, a thin, and then we have a color through, and then we have a gorgeous kind of color through compact or thick product, which is perfect for kind of tabletops and countertops. And um, just that kind of consistency of color is really gorgeous. It must, you know, it's like, it's like having more materials for a designer to imagine, right? That's exactly right. And and I think it's been really fun for our Formica team to talk to designers. It kind of feels like Christmas. We have this for you and we have this for you and we have this for you. So that's I, it's just been fun to add more to the creative toolbox for the design community. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure they get really, really excited to see. And also it's surprising, right? This is super, this is super chic. This is, this is very Euro, super chic. So it's a nice compliment, don't you think? It, it absolutely is. I mean, very much Italian design. And I think for us at Formica, it has really been fun to bring in the best of Italian design into our company and have that now be part of our DNA. Yeah, and Amy, so how are you, how are you guys doing? I understand that where you are, there are very few um, issues right now. I know you're being very careful. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's been, you know, relatively low here in Ohio. We were, Formica has been up and running throughout the lockdown as, as a essential business and creating surfaces for healthcare, um, which is wonderful, but also a, a tough, but we're, we're doing well. Um, and it's been, our team has had a lot of fun spending time on zoom um, with designers. And, uh, you know, we've had, We've had Wine Fridays um, with our, our design friends and, um, you know, but we're, we're doing well. Yeah, yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad. And so what is the thing that you're sort of most excited about for, for Micah in the future? What are the conversations um, that, are you, that you're having right now? You know, I'm really excited just about pushing the boundaries of surfacing with our Broadview parent company, they have an amazing center for surface innovation called Nemo. And it's 80 people in the Netherlands, surface chemists and technologists. And oh, oh, it's so cool. And so to be able to tap into their knowledge and kind of the collective experience of now our sister companies, I can't wait for the new things that we have coming down the pike. So that's what I'm excited about. And it's, you know, that's a cool thing too, to start to talk to the design community more about what do you wish you had? What are you missing? Um, and we want to create that then, so. Yeah, now you have, I mean, you, now you have the capabilities in a way that I don't know if anybody else does. It seems like it's almost the perfect timing. I hate to say anything's perfect right now, but the perfect yeah. timing to be able to really dig into the problems and try to find solutions for the designers because you know everything everything is changing in that way but you've already like got it in place yeah that that's absolutely right and I, you know I, if there is a silver lining to this i think it is it has given people an opportunity to kind of stop and pause and really think about what do i want what do i need going forward and and you do see creativity flourish 
And, and you know, we want to we wanna be part of that creativity that flourishes and, and help it flourish afterwards for something bigger and better. Yeah, we say, you know, we say now that, you know, health and wellness is going to be sort of in, on everybody's lips moving forward. And yeah, you, you're, you're sitting right there. Mm -hmm. and, and thinking about how do we bring health and wellness to every space, because there are surfaces everywhere we go. And that's such an important part of health and wellness. You want healthy surfaces. Right. So. And you know what the designers, like, I have a good friend in, um, been doing healthcare, health, healthcare and then health and wellness her whole career. And she said, you know, it's our responsibility as designers moving forward that we still have to create beauty. Yes, everyone's going to be really interested in that something's antimicrobial, but it's our responsibility to make it beautiful. Well, and I, I mean, what an amazing point, because I think beauty is part of wellness. Having beautiful things in our lives help us be well. So I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, basically the world's your oyster right now, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> and and we're, we're glad it's our oyster and, and we're excited to have, you know, I think one of the unique things about our industry, about kind of the world in which we live is the partnerships that you know, manufacturers and designers and architects are constantly talking and working together and playing with materials and, and figuring out how to elevate together. And that's, that's not every piece of, of the world. Um, so it's, it's a special place to be right now. Right, I think we will get on the other side and conquer it together for sure. Um, I was so pleased to hear about this competition that it was so wildly successful that yes. The entries were fantastic that you have great students from all over the country and Canada, by the way, amazing work coming out of Canada and uh, that people are that people are really being creative with Formica and then your new, the, is it an acquisition or a partnership? It's a partnership. It's partnership. a partnership. Yeah. yeah. And so, and, and I mean, the, the cool thing is uh, we have never virtually launched a product before. And starting May 5th, we started virtually launching a product. And so, I mean, super cool to, you know, send someone samples and have them sit on them for a week. And then we do a presentation and they go through their samples online. And I, I love it. I, I think it's changed, you know, the world will change as we go through this and as we come out of it. But the ways in which are, are there'll be some really cool things. Um, well, I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank you for your continued partnership with us. It means so much to us and for all that you're doing for the design industry, for Micah and Amy Gath. Um, we thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Cindy. This was fantastic. We're excited to, we love being a partner with Interior Design. So thank yeah. you. Yay. And yay to the students. A big congrats yay. to the students. Yay. Art and design is important to every realm of life. It was the inkling of that idea that I had when I started SCAD. SCAD was not like other colleges. I mean, it still isn't. What made you think, I want to start an art and design school? Like, you weren't really an artist and you weren't really a designer. But I saw a need in art and design. I was really thinking about, you know, art and design as a career. Business does not thrive without creative skills, without a creative mindset. What's new? What could be? Yeah. What are the possibilities?
So we're in yeah. the first. So we're in the we're first. We're in the build. very first building. building. This building was an old armory. So the militia back in Savannah, they they came a few days a week, but other than that, it really wasn't used. And so when we came along, then they said that's that's a good use for it. Yeah. And of course, I thought it was far too large for SCAD. And indeed, the first year we only used the ground floor. The idea of a new school. Yes. Like. Crazy. Yeah, right. <laughs> what was I thinking? Right. It's a good thing I didn't know right. everything that was going to be involved because maybe I would have never dared to try to start a university. Right. But I just thought about my students. I thought about what makes for the best educational mm -hmm. environment. But at the time, I was teaching in the public schools in Atlanta, and I was really focused on creativity. I was focused on the arts, and I just loved my students. Do you remember being sort of a creative kid growing up? Not so much creative. I did a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. I loved to read. I was just immersed in these imaginative worlds of books. Oh. You know, I think that kind of led to me thinking of spaces in an imaginative way, too. My parents were just very honorable, hardworking people. So my first paying job was being a piano teacher at age 12 to the other neighborhood children. Mm. So I was always around a group of positive people mm. and arts-oriented people. I don't know that most people would have known that really you came with nothing. Nothing. You came with My nothing. Volkswagen Beetle. Right. <laughs> but I sold it for, for scan. It was well worth it. I mean, a lot of things have been hard over the years, kind of confronting the educational establishment because SCAD is so different. And anything new is always viewed askance in education, especially right. higher education. Things don't change in higher education. Right. They don't change. They, and they didn't want to give you the credit. Oh, right? no, no, <laughs> no. But then it was just studying and doing the research myself. Yeah, that's crazy. We all volunteered for like the first years of SCAD because who else is going to do this except your family? Okay, wait, but I want to see this. So this is our college catalog. It's very clear what you need to take. Right. And then you see examples of student work. There is a type of person who likes to be in on the ground floor of something. Right. Those first students who came to SCAD, they're the trendsetters. They're the pioneers. So we're in the interior design home, right? We are. Clark Hall has been completely renovated this year to accommodate all new studio spaces for our students, designed to really create a professional model of a studio experience. Interior design was one of our very first eight degree programs at wow. SCAD, and now we have over 100 different degrees, all these different schools within SCAD, yeah. and we still don't teach usual courses of study. We teach right. things that our students want to devote their lives and careers to, mm -hmm. um, subjects that the professions tell us are needed. So what was the That's brief cool. Professor yeah. Prado from uh, Gulfstream? They have given us a lot of flexibility. It's amazing. We work with Volvo, BMW, Google. We work with Adobe. They're inviting our students to walk that path with them into the future. Perfect day for a convertible ride. There is so much history in Savannah. Obviously, a lot of political unrest, segregation. Yes. Tell us about the growth of all these different buildings around the city. What was that like? You know, this was all decimated, really. There were a lot of derelict eyesores. It was kind of considered dark and dangerous. Wow. Everything is so pretty around here now. It's Yeah, you have to watch the bicycles here uh -huh. and the tour buses. Yeah. <laughs> Savannah just has this charm and history about it, and I thought for students of art and design to especially see something that has lasted, architecture that has lasted, mm. especially with all the preservation that we've done. So sometimes I've seen the sky through the roof and the <laughs> earth through the floor. Wow. So pretty dramatic transformations sometimes take place. I think for new ideas, old buildings are perfect. Right old school buildings usually, buildings that had had other lives, an electrical company or a, a synagogue. 
This was the old railroad depot that was threatened with destruction. That building has so many stories. So when I found out about it, then we were able to intervene, and then eventually we were able to buy the property, and that is today the SCAD Museum of Art. But it's really become world class. It's certainly won many awards. It's yeah. good for the students, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So saving a city has been an unintentional outcome of an educational endeavor, which is really intended for the benefit of our students. Oh my goodness, look. <laughs> like, is this so picturesque yeah. you just can't even yeah. take it? Oh, the bike. Hello. I looked around me at other universities and I thought the environments were kind of cold mm. and dreary. Mm -hmm. And I wanted our students to have a place that they wanted to come to school. Right. Because I really feel the more time they spend in the classrooms, then the more they learn. But it's a full of design. Mm -hmm. Like everywhere you turn is creativity. We can make design from anything, especially the student art. So I'll practically take it off their walls if they will sell it to me. And then we find things. We find curiosities around all of our different campuses. And we always have to have a selfie moment everywhere. It is mainly classrooms and residence halls, but we also design swimming pools and we have a fitness center. We design an equestrian center. Uh, we have a community garden. Whatever students like and want and need, we design. Right. The first other campus was Lacoste and that was a big challenge. So it was kind of a finishing school in the arts mm, in, in France. Provence. You know, people would send their children there, like Robert Redford sent his children there. And it was a very meaningful place mm. for many, many people. Actually, one of our alums was helping them with historic preservation. So she suggested to the board, well, if you're interested in seeing that this goes into good hands, then think about SCAD. Then before I knew it, they had actually given us this whole campus in the south of France. That needed a lot of TLC. Needed a lot of work. <laughs> that let me know what it took to start another campus. Yeah. And my dad would say, well, if it's for the students, then do it. Right. So now they can spend a term in Savannah, a term in Hong Kong, a term in Lacoste, a term in Atlanta, or they can stay in one campus right. for their entire degree. I, I think you may be the reason that we have a generation of very Travelers. spoiled. No, spoiled. Because <laughs> they can do anything. You can have anything. <laughs> I'm so glad to see I you. I'm, I'm glad so I'm happy to get to see you. This is another scam alum. <laughs> <Hi. laughs> I love students. Yeah, yeah, I love students. Love to be around students. Um, it's my life. So 40 years. 40 years? Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. To be just a part of that is just like so overwhelming that there's yeah. so many people that, you know, SCAD is so important to them. They DM me, they email me, they come around. Maybe I can pull it out. I'll show yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's from a freshman first week at SCAD. I just wanted to say that I've worked extremely hard for this to get into this school. To me, it's more than a school, it's home. Mm -hmm. He said, I felt more at home here in a week than I ever have in my town with no opportunities. Yeah. Keep reading. I know, I know, I know. That's so beautiful. Yeah. See what you give people. You know, it's it's awesome to me to get to be a part of so many people's lives. Hey everyone, this is Cindy Allen, editor in chief of Interior Design Magazine. And we're talking to visionaries in the field because we need inspiration to get through these crazy times. And now is a special, special guest. We have the president and founder of SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design, and the most extraordinary, Paula Wallace. Hi, Paula. Hey, Cindy. Tell me about Design TV. This is so cool. <laughs> you know what? You know, I think the word of the day, and you're exactly like this too, is, and I love the word, it's like pivot. Like we pivot really, really fast. And you know, we've been talking about doing a channel forever, I would say. And um, when all of this happened, we all got, a bunch of us got on a Zoom call and we're like, 
the channel, we're starting to de design TV and that's that. And we did it in a week. <laughs> we're going to do this today. And you know, we have these incredible documentaries that I've been, you know, I've been doing them for 20 years. So everyone just saw the documentary we did on you, Paula, when we inducted you into the Hall of Fame. And I'm, glad, I'm, I'm glad I wasn't watching it at the time because I would have teared up. Oh, you're so, you're so sweet. And you know, uh, the other thing was, and for those listening in, it had gotten accepted into the, um, into the Sonoma Film Festival, which was supposed to be like last week, I think, Paula. Wow. So, um, so it didn't play there and there was no festival, but we are <laughs> playing it. And okay. I'm so honored that you're here to talk to us. I mean, just a couple things about the video and then we'll get onto uh, what's really mm -hmm. happening. So mm -hmm. one thing, when I say like we're looking for inspiration, you are honestly one of the most incredible people I've, I've met. And I think the documentary really shows that you need to be dedicated to something and just go for it because you were dedicated to education and you had a dream. I mean, SCAD would have never happened honestly, it wouldn't happen without you. Well, I think, you know, artists and designers have always been nimble and always responded to the moment. They've always acclimated to the times. And, you know, SCAD was just a, a concept that was needed at the time. And it's just evolved over the years to have many successful professionals out there and contributing in many different ways around the world. So it's a joy to me to be just a part of it. Right, but you know, I think because we see it as like such a successful, creative, encouraging university or college, right? You call it a college? You call it a college? It's a university. Okay. We call it SCAD because that's easy to say and people like saying it. So. Oh, okay. okay, all right. I didn't know if there was lingo or something. But, <laughs> but so most people, don't really have the opportunity to see where it starts, right? So mm -hmm. it didn't start with loads of money. It didn't even start in a town that was like a burgeoning <laughs> town. I mean, you you really like re-energized uh, Savannah. You re-energized a whole, a whole generations of students. And um, it's crazy when I went to visit you because the students were just like, over the moon to be around you and at the school. Mm -hmm. It's my joy, really. I stay in touch with students. A student was texting me this morning about how great his film class is and wanted to give a high five to his professor. And so I really stay in touch with the students and I miss them now that they're not on campus this quarter because of the world health crisis that we're all experiencing. But um, we pivoted, as you said, and we created a whole virtual learning uh, environment for our students. And that's been very rewarding too. And it's very timely because this remote working is just the way of today, the way of the future. Yeah, I was, I was gonna ask you because um, maybe not everybody would know that actually SCAD has four locations, right? So you're mm -hmm. Savannah, Atlanta, Hong Kong, and then Lacoste, France. So yes. that, and so e-learning too. So we've had since 2004, we've had accredited degree programs, including interior design, uh, available through e-learning. So we're quite experienced with uh, technology and teaching with technology. This was a change, though, uh, this spring when we found that we couldn't gather, and so everyone was heartbroken. I mean, the students were saying, "Oh, I want to come back to campus," and. And we all did too, but you know, it just wasn't possible. So we just pivoted and changed. We, we really have a strong culture at SCAD. And yeah. so that became the basis of our being able to teach virtually this quarter. Mm. You, you, um, to, uh, again, if you haven't been to Savannah and haven't been to SCAD, you have to. The kids are literally dancing and singing in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> it's a happy place. Yeah. Really, there's that, um, that you know, frisson of the old and the new. You have the, you know, students um, who are like very hip, chic, cool, smart from all over the world. And then you've got Savannah, which is a historic city, um, the first city of Georgia, one of the original 13 colonies. So it has that historic character to it. So it has this 
almost dignified majesty to it. It also has the beautiful environment of all the outdoor living rooms, the squares, the parks that Savannah is so famous for, the live oak trees that are centuries old with the Spanish moss just dripping down. It's so romantic. It's a very romantic place. It, it really is. Um, late, it's so funny that you're saying that because later this week I'm going to be talking to a firm that does a lot of um, public spaces and outdoor spaces and the importance of that now. But it's so true in Savannah. Um, all those beautiful squares and all the nature. It is just so lush. Mm -hmm. It's a walking city. Yeah. And Scandinavia made its reputation as um, utilizing the principles of historic preservation, of rehabilitating um, kind of, um, you know, forgotten, uh, forgotten buildings that had kind of died, really, and they were revived because they needed a use. They needed people. They needed ideas. And so we were able to provide that and have a meaningful um, environment for the students too because they see firsthand the importance of history classical traditions that are carried forward and then they create their own traditions yeah you're always looking at a building as like opportunity right opportunity mm -hmm. is knocking it may be a little <laughs> rusty or dusty but we'll make it into something special that's the challenge of taking something um <clears throat> excuse me that maybe was an ugly duckling and turning it into a swan. But I love the challenge of designing within a footprint, an existing footprint that one must respect because it is historic. It's on the national, um, you know, it, it's on the national <laughs> historic monuments list. Right. And whole city is a, is a historic monument. And so there's not a lot to do to the exterior buildings, but we can have a lot of fun with the interiors. And you do, and you really, really do. <laughs> now, Paula, tell us, just so we have, like, sort of in our imagination, what was the last big event that um, you were able to uh, host at SCAD? So, you know, we have festivals all the time. We have speakers all the time. You know, it's just we participate in all the films. You know, Georgia is the biggest film producing state because of the tax incentives and also the beauty of the, of the natural environment. And because of SCAD, too, because we, you know, for instance, the Council of Dads, which is a new NBC show, was shot there. And we had 68 students work on that television show. So the students get the opportunity to actually work on a lot of films. It's just, um, it's a very lively environment. So we do so many things all the time. And Savannah right now is very quiet for a change. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing. When I think about you, I think of celebrating design and all the arts and everyone gets involved. I think um, I remember the first, I don't know what it's called, but was it the first like kind of project you did at SCAD was, wasn't it chalk art all around? Arts, yes, yeah. Sidewalk, Sidewalk Arts Festival. And we, have, we use the entire Forsyth Park and thousands and thousands of people come and thousands of artists participate too. So this year we've got to figure out a way to do it virtually. So that'll be, stay tuned. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you can. Yeah, so that's the thing. You've always been able to be super creative and obviously the focus always about the kids. So tell mm -hmm. us what are the, and you know, and then this happens and you have to really think about what kind of changes you're going to implement for them. And I know you want to be close to them. So mm -hmm. give us a few um, thoughts about what's, what it's going to look like in the future for this semester at least. Mm -hmm. We have both synchronous and asynchronous classes, which means some of the classes are live, just as you, you, you and I are talking right now. And one of the professors kind of described it to me as though it looks like the Brady Bunch because she sees all of her students in little boxes uh -huh. on the screen. Um, so these, these are synchronous classes, but then there are asynchronous classes too, which are totally online and students from all over the world can participate in them. So uh, we have both, and um, it's just the choice of students as to what they usually choose. But this quarter, everything is virtual or online. So fortunately, we've really established a good you know, expertise in this area of technology and education. And so you know, we were able to pull that off. But some of the professors said it was kind of like looking at like a big mountain when we realized that we couldn't actually come to campus for the spring term. 
Yeah, I, sp I spoke with Margaret Russell and we were, hmm. we're, talking, we're sharing, talking about, you know, what I could do to help, how I could help. Um, I'm certainly happy to do something with the students. So we, we got to think about that. You must, you must. Yeah, we're having mentors um, come in, our professional mentors, like, um, you know, actors and writers and right. artists and people who, um, well, we have one very excellent a magazine ed editor. <laughs> 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 but, um, you know, we, we have um, all these guests for students to learn from. And then also a lot of alumni who are out there working professionally and they come back to campus every quarter. Mm, yeah, I mean, that's what's so amazing about, um, you know, seeing your, seeing all the posts that you do on Instagram, it's just the, the variety and really the love of all the arts. And yes, from kids we don't know at all that we may know in the future that you really believe in to famous artists, famous actors, everyone supporting um, one another, which, I think that goes without saying we're going to be doing a lot more of now, but you were doing it before. I think communication is so key. This is just taking communication to a whole other level. I think that uh, the human voice is something that I've noticed that people are being very attuned to because, you know, we were texting a lot, but maybe we weren't talking so much. And now with Zooming and just with conversations, I've been having a lot of conversations with all the faculty as far as getting the courses structured in the way that can we can best prevent present the information and so i've been really appreciating the value of the human voice yeah i i, com I completely agree and it keeps reminding me of like somehow the different generations with this crisis are learning from the other right mm -hmm. and it's sort of like you know we may say like oh yeah we you know we text all the time too but we used to not we used to want to be on the phone right and, we remember. <laughs> yeah we remember so it's sort of nice to get back to it and like hear a voice and it's just a relief and mm -hmm. yeah i think it's that human connection mm -hmm. so tell me so paula um so you have been you know the different locations you have classes that are remote anyway um are you thinking about um what the future of education might look like or the beginning of what that might look like? Well, you know, we have um, a, a whole division of SCAD that's a consultancy for businesses called SCAD Pro. And mm -hmm. so just this quarter, we're working with Train, uh, the air conditioning company. Um, we're working with Gulfstream on the design of an airplane, you know, cabin. You know, we're working with, um, Mm, National Society of High School Scholars about encouraging excellent high school students to peer tutor other students. We're also our advertising students are doing a whole campaign that is a prompt from the UN about how to communicate about public health. And it will be then distributed uh, by the World Health Organization. And it's, it's about how to communicate despite differences in language and culture about how to best preserve um, and foster public health. So, you know, we're, we're used to doing a lot of these things. We have a luxury marketing class that is all about um, luxury technology. So it's about automotive, it's about boating, it's about consumer electronics um, in that category and how to best uh, market that. So it's, it's, it's all about all these different um, majors that we have in, in architecture, um, the professors are teaching as they would in a firm. They're working remotely and often, as you know, interior designers and architects work with partners from other firms in other cities. They're working with a client who's also remote. They're working on an assignment that's also remote. So those complexities, you know, the students yeah. are getting a taste of that. And I think they'll be well received by the firms because they will have that experience. It's the way that profession, the professions have worked, but colleges haven't worked that way. Yeah, and, and I, I, have to, I have to commend you because it's very clear when you're at SCAD that your mission is for, for these students to get out of school and see a future. And yes. the, the, as soon as you can connect them with business, you do. And it's, mm -hmm. first of all, it's realistic. It's the way it should be. It's almost like 
you, uh, you really understand what's needed and you've broken all the rules <laughs> in the best way. Thank you. Well, it's a triangulation of the student and the professions and then the university. So, you know, we're all working together with the same goals and outcomes, really. You guys are, are working on something, some prototypes, right? Well, yes, we're, we're printing 3D masks for the local hospitals and also some extender straps that make wearing some of the traditional masks more comfortable. We were hearing from some of the doctors in the local hospitals that it gets a little hard on the ears when you're wearing those all the time. So we made these little extender straps that we made in our 3D printing studio and then the masks too. And um, it's just, you know, everything we can do to help. A lot of our alumni who are especially from fashion are pitching in. They've, you know, one alum who usually has a bridal uh, line, she has already made 10,000 masks, which she's distributed. So um, all of our graduates, they're, they're, they're trying to do their part. Everybody's trying to do their part and our students and our professors. Yeah, well, you're certainly um, the perfect example for a student that you can make anything happen in your life. You can do anything positive. It takes a lot of hard work. You can never give up. It takes creative thinking, um, but you really are that kind of inspiration for them. And I definitely see that we need you for the future too, Paula. <laughs> so I want to thank you for everything you do in the education field and the, the design field and the art field and the fashion field. Oh my God, she does it all. Uh, Paula Wallace, um, sending you virtual hugs and oh, love. Right you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> love you so much. Love you, love you too, Paula. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. <laughs>